Hey kids, uh, welcome to your Digital SAT Reading and Writing Virtual Classroom. Uh, my name is Jin Bay, but a lot of you guys know me as Jin Sem or Jin Teacher. Guys, I wanted to take you guys, uh, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a peek into this course, kind of what it contains, um, how it was made, and who this course is really for. So as you guys can kind of see here, um, and I'll kind of dive into it a little bit more in another slide, uh, this course basically just has four practice exams that are very similar to the actual Digital SAT uh, tests. And I'll kind of dive into that in just a little bit, but before I do, you guys, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a high-level view about who I am. So again, uh, my name is Jin Bay, but most of my kids call me Jin Sem or Jin Teacher. So I'm a top 1% score in any and all things verbal related, right? Whether it's on the TOEFL exam, the ACT, the SAT, or the GMAT sections, I've, I've achieved top 1% scores in those uh, different standardized tests. I also have over 14 years of experience uh, working with over 7,000 students students in one of the most academically competitive cities in the world, which is right here in Seoul, South Korea, right in the, the meccas of Hagwons, uh, Dechidong and in Apgujong. Um, I also have I'm also an author, I still can't believe that, and a content creator. Um, I've created over thousands, I've created thousands of questions for the ACT English, the SAT writing, the digital SAT writing, uh, the SAT reading, and the digital SAT reading sections of these tests. Uh, so I do have some experience under my belt. Also, uh, just signed a contract a couple of days ago with a Korean publishing company, and so uh, my first official book is going to be released in, I'm not sure when, maybe about a month or so, depending on when you guys are watching this video. Um, but it just, this is all to say, you guys, uh, it, it's not to brag, but it's really, it's not to try to impress you guys. That's not who I am. Uh, but this is all to really try to impress upon you the idea that this course isn't created by just some random person or some AI. Right? Uh, I did use ChatGPT in making these questions, but right, these, these questions were all dictated by my understanding of this test. And I do have many, many years of knowledge and expertise right, with the SAT, and that's really what I've poured into this course. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of an outline or a view of what this course consists of. And uh, what you'll get is you'll get four, I call them premium tests, the ERW practice test. So this course doesn't include any math section tests, right? That's not, that's beyond my, um, my scope of knowledge, and I'm not gonna dare to venture into that portion of this test. So I'm gonna stay in my comfort zone, in my areas of expertise, right, and just made, so I made four practice tests for the evidence-based reading and writing sections of this course. Also, you guys, this course contains adaptive modules, right? So just like the SAT, you'll have an easy version and a hard version modules too. And that depends on how you do in module one, right? So in module one, if you get more than nine questions wrong, then you're likely gonna take the easy version for modules two. And if you get fewer than nine wrong, you'll jump into the hard version for modules two. Um, so basically, all in all, there's over 300, about 320 SAT SAT level questions. Um, I also, within these videos, um, I explain each of the questions, right, kind of one by one. And within those explanations, I'll give you guys high level, right, top 1% tips and strategies about how to solve these questions more efficiently, more effectively, with more confidence and certainty. So just to kind of reiterate, you guys, I've put in my 10,000 hours, right? So I've put in over 10,000 hours, probably close to about 20,000 hours now um, of SAT or just test prep content stuff. You know, so whether that's studying for, taking, teaching, analyzing, creating content for, creating videos around, creating practice quest, quest, test questions for, um, tutoring, you know, all of that stuff, right? I'd probably say I have about 20,000 hours or so, right, of just experience. You know, so that's just kind of gives you a little bit of insight into who's actually making this test, right? So you have, I mean, the, the number one I think uh, the number one biggest issue in the marketplace these days for the digital SAT is just the sheer amount of content that's out there, right? So it's not it's not difficult to find um, practice to find practice questions, right? Uh, or to find a digital mock SAT test platform, right? With um, access for you guys to, to try hundreds of practice questions, right? Even for free or for really, really cheap. You know, I get that, right? But that to me, in my eyes, is a problem because the quality of the content itself, right, is the most important thing. And I don't think that a lot of businesses have your interest in mind, right? And so a lot of these questions are not created from um, experts who are in the field, you know, who've lived it, done it, breathed it, right, uh, for over a couple of decades. 
right? Most of these platforms create these questions from either, you know, maybe English majors, right? PhDs with English backgrounds, uh, you know, or with just ChatGPT straight up, right? Um, you know, and so it's really the quality of the questions that uh, will differentiate, right? One practice test course from another. And so I wanted to just kind of point or highlight, right? Like to understand, you guys have to understand, right? Who, the who behind the person who's making these questions, right? And so I've, I've, I've achieved the top 1% scores in multiple disciplines, right? In multiple practice tests, in multiple exams, SAT, ACT, you know, TOEFL and the GMAT exams, um, multiple times. And I've also led hundreds of students to these, uh, to these scores as well, you know? Um, and so just gives you a sense of, right, the care and the quality, the care and the time that I put into writing or making these questions um, and the quality of the levels of these questions. So what I wanted to kind of do is just give you guys a little bit of an, a look into, a little bit of a look into uh, how your course will look. Right, so I try to make this as easy and convenient for you guys as possible, right? So I wanted to do all the dirty work and uh, take away all of the sort of, um, the, the, the looking at multiple materials and uh, being able to, not, not, not having as difficult of a time, right, uh, with these, with your SAT experience. I wanted to make your SAT experience as simple and straightforward as possible. So one of the ways that I did that, right, is just by the design of the uh, questions themselves, right? So you'll notice here, um, you'll never get lost basically, right? You'll have the question number, which module you're on, right? Which portion, the reading or the writing style question. And also I think this is gonna be really helpful is the type of question, right, that uh, the SAT is asking. So one of the sort of, unclear things about the SAT, one of the sort of Ashiwan things about the SAT, I think, is the way that they label the questions, right? So they have four different categories or four different labels of questions. You have a craft and structure, you have information and ideas, and those are the two categories for the reading questions. And then you have standard English conventions and you have expression of ideas, and those are the two categories for the writing questions, right? Well, that's how the SAT just kind of labels all of their questions. Right, well, that's very sort of broad and general, right? And so what I did was I, I went an extra layer deeper into kind of narrowing down, right, what specific type of question or what specific concept the SAT is testing you f within that category of question, right? So just wanted to show you guys that here. So all four categories of questions are, um, are gonna be presented in, in your slides, right, um, on your videos. Yeah, and within that, or next to it though, you'll know the specific sort of concept, right, or question type that this question is testing you on, right? So I'll give you guys just a little bit of, of a preview uh, or a view of those different types. So we have a craft and structure question, the words and context or vocab and context questions here. We also have a different type of craft and structure question. Uh, we have the sort of big picture stuff, right? The main ideas, we have the main purpose, right? The overall structure and things like that. And I did go, uh, I did go as far as to even include poetry. So I wanted to show you guys this because a lot of students have difficulty with poetry. I made sure to include a lot of poems in this question. And trust me guys when I tell you this, I don't like poetry, but I know that you guys need help with poetry. So I made, I made sure to include more poetry questions right within your test experience. Um, and you'll see the way that the, the, the answer choices are awarded too, it would be exactly like you'll see on the actual test, right? That's exactly what I did. Um, you notice information ideas, right? So another area that um, a lot of a lot of test prep, you know, sort of practice to test uh, kind of lack in terms of quality is going to be within with the uh, infographics, right? With the with the with the graphic types of questions. And so I have a bunch of these too. It's about two per module, right? So that's going to equate to about twenty or so, right, of these infographic questions. So it'll give you guys the repetitions that you need, right, to really boost your scores to really get into those top tier scores. Um, because these questions can feel very overwhelming for a lot of students uh, if you don't get the repetitions. But once you get the repetitions in the system of how to answer these questions, these questions aren't that difficult for you, right? So just to give you a sense of um, just all of the different styles of questions that you'll see, um, you know, uh, in this course, right? So just going, jumping over to the writing section, and I don't want to get in too much into detail with, with this, but same thing with the writing questions too. Instead of just saying standard English conventions, because that'll, 
break that that can be broken down into multiple question types and concepts, right? Like punctuation, and even within punctuation, you have commas, you have apostrophes, you have semicolons, colons, dashes, you know, periods, uh, question marks, right? Um, indirect, direct questions. Um, you know, you also have other grammar concepts too, right? Modifiers, verbs, pronouns, right? Sentence structure, right? Dependent clauses, you know? So, so it's just, it's not enough to just tell you guys that, hey, this question belongs to the standard English conventions, right? So I really think that this course is really helpful uh, because it clarifies, right? What the SAT leaves very unclear and ambiguous, right? Just wanted to give you guys a sense of that. And also to a lot of students, I'm not sure why they tell me that they, they, they have trouble with these rhetorical synthesis questions. These questions aren't that hard, but I also made sure to include at least two of these per module as well. So you'll get enough of the repetitions, right, for each type of question um, on, uh, in this course, right? And uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of mention before I jump into this slide, you guys, is the way that I created these questions is I, 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 I analyzed, right, uh, all of the all of the material that College Board had released, right? And even some of the ones that they don't have officially released, right? So just official exams, but unreleased ones. Um, it's, it's, you can get access to that. Uh, and, and I studied those very, very carefully, right? And based off of what I noticed or what I observed, I created these questions. Um, I created these questions to mimic, right? Those questions too. So you'll see that these, the level of questions uh, in this course, going to be very, very, very similar, right, to the level of questions um, that you know you guys will see on the College Board, whether it's on the Blue Book exam or from an official test if you guys have taken one. Okay, so who exactly is this course for, right? And I thought about this, and this course is really designed for two students. One is my primary target, and the other one is just. It's a secondary type of student. Um, so I think that this course is primarily for uh, what I call the untrained test taker, right? This, the student who just needs more training, right? Um, who needs more repetitions under his or her belt, right? But the second category of students that this course is going to be designed for are those who are late to the party, right? So I'll kind of show you some of the characteristics, right, of each student um, right here. So the untrained test taker, you guys, yeah, these guys do have some test prep experience, but they really struggle in the verbal section, right? And this is the section that um, I think that I, I've developed an expertise around, and, and, I, and I know it very, very, very well right, um, like to the core, to the depths of what these questions are all about. Uh, these questions, are, or these types of students too, are also very sort of unsure when they're solving verbal questions. Um, they don't know how to read properly. Like they choose their answer based on feel versus facts, right? Uh, they choose their answer based on words that they see in the answer choice and the, uh, the passage, so they match words instead of understanding the ideas and, and matching ideas, right? They have no mental framework. They don't have a process for how to answer these questions kind of step by step. So these guys might have taken like, you know, the six college board exams, um, they might have taken one or two SAT tests and they think that they have the proper experience and the proper training to do well on this test. Well, the mistake that they make is that rep just Taking practice tests without having a clear plan and a clear strategy, right, to approach these questions isn't proper training. So that's what I call these types of test takers. They're untrained. Like they need more guidance. They need more training, right? And that's what I'll really provide, right? They need guidance from an expert. And also they need someone who's been through it and helped other people go through, right, to get to where they want to get to, you know? And, and I think that's where I can really, really help, right? So, you know, if you need, you know, for the students who need like top 1% strategy and tips, you know, and need that sort of expert guidance, right? They want to see the test from the eyes of someone who's not only scored in the top 1%, but who's helped other people score in the top 1% as well. Um, that's, this course is going to be right for you. Now, the second category of students uh, that this course is designed for are the ones who are late to the party. So these guys, uh, it's a little bit Oshawa, but these guys didn't really know they need, needed the SAT, so they registered late, right? So they don't have much time, right, to, to study for and prepare for the test. So they need some kind of quick fix or quick solutions to um, before they jump into their exam, because they don't want to. They don't want to take. Uh, they don't want to take a full course. And they don't want to just take the exam without having any experience, right? And so these guys need something quick, right? Last minute help is what I call it. You know, so uh, I think that this course is going to be really right for these types of students. Now, I, mean, I can't guarantee that these students are going to get the score that they want just because they don't have any knowledge or any experience prior. 
right? But what I can tell you guys is if, if you, for those students who need like that quick, right, that practical guidance, right, from an expert who can help you to increase your score quickly, right, not necessarily get you to the score that you want to get to, but help you to increase your score and give you and help you become more familiar with the test in a short period of time, this course is going to be right for you. Okay, and so those are the two types of students that this course is designed really for. Um, and before I kind of go, is I wanted to let you guys know that um, as an extra bonus, right, I don't want you guys, I don't want your learning to just stop with these practice tests. Because I know that it's not going to be enough for most of you guys. Like you guys need to interact with me in real time, right? So one of the things that I'm going to offer to you guys, which hardly, I don't think anyone really does, is um, free interactions through my YouTube channel. So this is my YouTube channel. It's called Jin Teaches. I might change it to Jin Teacher, but for now, Jin Teaches is it. And um, that's me uh, looking really confused or curious, I guess. But um, you know, on this channel, you guys, um, you know, I, I will give you guys uh, some foundational lessons, right? I'll teach you guys more strategy. I'll be posting answer explanations for questions either released by College Board or just questions that I design on my own. Um, I'll even offer maybe, you know, free Q&A sessions and even like special like live classes, um, you know, all on YouTube. So it's a great place to connect with like-minded people, right, who want to, who want what you want. Right, which is basically to maximize your potential, right, and see how far you can actually get to, right, and that's the type of community that I'm that I'm committed to to creating, and um, so if you want or if you're interested in being a part of that kind of community and having live access to me uh, for free, um, I'm not cheap, you guys, but if you want live access to me for free, uh, this is a great place to go. Okay, so hop onto this channel, subscribe all that YouTube stuff, right? Hit the notification bell, you know, subscribe and hit that thumbs up button. You don't have to do all that, but subscribe to it because this channel is going to change the course of your SAT journey. I guarantee you guys that. Okay, because my, my commitment to you guys is I, I am committed to helping you guys uh, get fewer than five wrong in the ERW section. But I know that that isn't, like this course itself isn't going to be, isn't going to help, isn't going to um, get most students there. Like a, a big handful of students will be able to get there, but those are the students who are really proactive and self, you know, they, they self study, um, they, they review a lot, right? They have their own sort of structure and they think on their own. Um, those students will be able to get the score that they need to with this course, right? But for the majority of us, right? For about half of us or so, um, a little bit more than half of us, like we need some extra guidance. You know, you need that live interaction. You need that feedback. You need those foundational lessons. And this place, the, this YouTube channel is the perfect place to go to to get that. I'm no longer in Korea. I moved back to Honolulu, Hawaii. So Hawaii is my home now. I'm also starting a PhD program in a couple of weeks. Um, but I am committed to continue growing this channel and growing this community to help you guys out. That is my 100% commitment to you. So again, you guys, I will see you here. And I will also see a lot of you guys in the practice test course. Okay? Take care, you guys. Hey kids, you know, welcome to your digital SAT ERW, that's evidence-based, I like to say English, but evidence-based reading and writing a digital classroom. Guys, I am your host, your instructor, uh, your teacher, your guide, your number one fan, your biggest supporter. Uh, my name is Jin Bay, but you guys can call me Jin Sem or Jin Teacher. Um, guys, I, I know that this is the very first video in a long series of videos um, that give where I explain each of these uh, questions that you guys answered from these practice tests that you guys have take that you guys took. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a high level view of uh, what these practice tests are all about and how they were kind of created. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know, uh, I have achieved top 1% scores in the verbal sections, um, anything English related whether it's reading comprehension or uh, re 
critical reasoning or um, grammar, punctuation, all that kind of stuff. I've scored in the top 99th percentile on the verbal sections of multiple standardized exams multiple times, like the SAT, the ACT, the TOEFL, and the GMAT exams. Um, I've been recognized as a top test prep instructor in Seoul, South Korea, uh, multiple times throughout my career. And I've taught over 7,000 students. Um, in Seoul. And what I did was uh, I created four uh, full-length practice exams for the reading and writing questions for the digital SAT. I, ma I made this especially for students who struggle with the verbal sections right, of practice tests, which is most international students. Um, so I really hope that this, these series of videos really helps you guys out. Uh, what I thought I'd do, you guys, throughout these videos was just give you a little bit of insight into how my mind processes information you know, and how I think through questions right in real time. So uh, these explanations to these questions, they're going to give you a peek into the inner workings of my mind and how I like to think through right these questions. And you're going to get to see how my mind works in real time. Um, I know I created these questions, uh, but you know, it's still uh, very, very helpful, right, for me uh, to kind of work through these questions, kind of in a sort of systematic or a step-by-step -step way. Um, and it, it doesn't just because I created these questions doesn't mean that I can, you know, perfectly explain things perfectly all the time, right? Because our minds just don't work like that. And so this will be a great opportunity for you guys to kind of see how my mind thinks through stuff in real time. You know, and that's what this that's what these series of videos is really all about. So guys, I have to apologize to you ahead of time as I am not perfect. You know, I am not perfect. And I know nobody really is except, you know, there's only one person who truly is. Um, you know, kind of immaculate. So I uh, just want you guys to kind of be patient with me and kind of um, be very understanding. Um, you know, I am pretty good at this stuff and I do uh, want to, you know, help you guys out as best as I possibly can, you know, and I thought that this would be a very interesting and a very sort of unique way to kind of um, teach you guys right because if you can kind of listen to my thought process i'm basically going to be thinking out loud right it'll help a lot of you guys kind of pick up on how my mind processes stuff right and that'll help that'll give you guys the opportunities to take what you like take what makes sense to you and apply it to your thought processes as well Okay, so this is going to be a little bit sort of less, a lot less teaching right? and a lot more just kind of um, like thinking out loud, right? How my mind kind of works. So we'll see how this works, you guys. Yep. Um, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Uh, please send me some messages and give me any and all the sort of feedback that you guys, um, that you guys truthfully wants to uh, because I want nothing more than just to support you guys in the best ways I know how um, and I thought that this would be kind of a, a very helpful ways to a lot of you um, and it is going to be a little bit different from the style that I normally kind of explain questions on um, but hopefully helpful nonetheless okay so let's jump into it you guys uh, so we're going to jump into practice test number one uh, module one and i labeled this part one um, because each module is going to have a series of parts right um, depending on how long it takes me to uh, explain a series of questions i'm going to try to keep each video to within 30 minutes um, hopefully try to get like four or five questions in maybe even more right during that time we'll see how this works guys i am going to also when we look at a particular question i just want to give you guys a sort of layout or the structure of each of these questions that you're gonna that you guys have worked through so what you'll notice here right is the question number you'll notice the question category right so the digital sat or the college board kind of labels the erw questions in four categories right we have craft and structure uh, we have information and ideas um, we have uh, standard, standard English conventions, right? and we have expression of ideas, right? Um, the two grammar sort of concepts or question types, categories, I should say. So I labeled the category here. It's pretty broad, 
right? And uh, more specifically, within that category, I labeled the specific sort of question type, you know? So the more specifically that we can kind of define each of these questions, right, based on type and concepts that are tested, the more helpful it's going to be for you guys to organize your minds, right, when you're going through and uh, when, you, when you're taking these tests, okay? So for example, question number one, we have a craft and structure question. More specifically, the, um, it's, the question type is, you could call it words in context or vocab in context is all. And so you'll see the, the, the passage here, the question stem and then the answer choices, right? Pretty much. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to kind of read the question or read the passage kind of once through and uh, read the question stem, and then I'll kind of take you guys through um, my mind, right, and how I like to process this information. Okay, so we'll give it a shot. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Let's jump in. So here, question number one, the passage reads, the new interns quickly became valued team members due to their blank ability to learn and adapt. Within just a few days, they were handling complex tasks that usually require weeks of training. The supervisor noted that such quick mastery is rare and highly commendable. Uh, so which choice completes the text with the most logical and precise word or phrase? By the way, just quick FYI for your information. Um, get familiar with the wording of the question. Right? And if you just take a quick glance at the answer choices, you know it's going to be a words in context question, right? So do you need to read the question stem so precisely here? Probably not, right? So for those of you, so as along the way, I'm going to be kind of sharing with you guys some tips, uh, some test taking tips um, that not only me, but nine, my top 1% students, right, kind of like use. Um, these are not just, these are not exclusively my strategies, although a lot of them are, they're also really kind of cool strategies and tips that I learned along the way from brilliant students, right? Who just, who are incredible test takers, you know? Um, and so I wanna kind of share those with you guys along the way, okay? So anywhere we can be a little bit more efficient with our um, test taking, right? Uh, we want to employ those strategies, okay? So cool. So the first thing, taking you guys through my, my thought process, right? I notice that the words, um, they're valued team members, right? They have some kind of ability to learn and adapt, right? I know it's gonna be some kind of positive word, right? Within just a, within just a few days, it doesn't take them very long, right? They're able to do things well. Right, the supervisor noticed that such quick mastery is rare and highly commendable. Okay, guys, what I'm doing right here is I'm I am uh, note taking, right? I am noting what I call context cues or context clues. Okay, uh, guys, the correct answer to these questions to vote words in context questions will undoubtedly, unequivocally always be based off of words that are used, that are given in the context of the passage, right? I call this context clues or context cues. So, you know, uh, I, I circled the sort of context clues that are really important here, right? We know that we're trying to find a, a word that really describes their ability levels of these team members, right? And one of the things we can do is Hey kids, welcome back to your Digital SAT Reading and Writing Digital Classroom. Uh, again, it's me, my name is Jin Bay, but you guys can just call me Jin Sem or Jin Teacher. Um, guys, so you all finished Practice Test 1, Module 1. Remember, the Digital SAT exam is an adaptive test, which means that how you do on Module 1 will determine whether you get the easy version or the hard version for Modules 2. So for those of you who got fewer than nine wrong for module one, you guys are gonna take the hard version, right? And for those of you guys who got more than nine wrong, you got nine wrong or more, you guys are gonna take the easy version for modules two. Now I would recommend that all of you guys just, that you guys just do, Take the practice tests like you would the actual test, which means that if you got fewer than nine wrong, take the hard version. 
If you got more than nine wrong, take the easy version for modules two. But after you do that, I would just, to get some extra practice solving digital SAT questions, I would just use the leftover module, right, to practice and self-study with. Um, because th I created these questions, you guys, yeah, uh, to represent as best as I possibly could the actual test questions on released digital SAT exams by the College Board and also a few unreleased exams, but I can't say that out loud too loudly. Um, so I would highly recommend that you guys answer as many questions on these tests as possible. And for the leftover test, when you guys are using that to self-study, take your time. Right, like just do them in a very concentrated, untimed environment. And if you need to, spend about 15 minutes on a particular question, right? Just really study the questions because I really wrote these questions, not just the questions themselves, but the passages too. I really wrote them in the style, the length, the level of difficulty, the sentence structure, the syntax, right? As you'll see on the actual exam. So really become a student of these questions, okay? So anyways, so for those of you guys who are on um, the easy version of modules two, we'll go ahead and jump into this practice test. Now some students ask me, well, what's the difference between module, between the easy version and the hard version for modules two? Um, the only real difference is the distribution of questions, right? So you'll get more hard level questions for the hard version than you will easy level questions, right? And then again, for the easy version, you'll get more easy questions than you will hard questions. But you still do get a handful of hard questions on the easy version, just like you would get some a handful of easy questions on the hard version for modules too. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into this, you guys, uh, with the words in context question, starting with question number one. So again, I'm going to take you guys through my thought process. And since we kind of spent some time doing this uh, more in length and detail, I shared with you guys some tips and strategies in the first module for practice test one. I have to get used to the terminology and the vocab as well. Um, but I did go over, I did explain a lot of tips and strategies for the, in the previous videos when talking about these questions. So I'll try not to spend as much time uh, when explaining these questions, but just at the same time, give you guys my thought process as best as I can. Okay, so here it says, the recent, tur the recent uh, blank in tourism in Kyoto, Japan has positively impacted local businesses with many reporting significant increases in revenue. See, these are all very positive things, right? This influx of visitors, uh, this type of language is very critical. Uh, it's very important to notice, right? These are called determiners or demonstrative pronouns, right? When you say this influx, or what influx are you talking about, right? Uh, when I say this book, well, what book are you talking about? When I say this person, you're like, what person am I talking about, right? Well, in the context of grammar, when you use this type of language, this influx of visitors, you're referring to some information that was mentioned in the previous sentence, right? So for example, if I say Lord of the Rings was written by Christopher Tolkien, then I say this book, right, or that book changed my life, right? What book are you referring to? You're referring to the book in the previous sentence, right? The Lord of the Rings, right? So just as in that example, right? When you say this influx of visitors, you're reporting um, this influx would be the influx of visitors that have come in, bam, via tourism in Japan. Right? Okay. So here we say, uh, this influx of visitors has also led to improvements in infrastructure and services throughout the city. Okay, so we know our job. We don't have to read the question stem, right? Because it appears exactly the same way, right? Uh, for, these, for this type of question again and again and again. So don't waste your time reading this. So what I know is, uh, I know that the word here has to be a positive word, right? Um, and what I notice, if I just take a quick glance at the answer choices, boom, I want to start with the words that I'm most confident about, right? I'm pretty confident about all of these words, right? But I know, I, I see one that stands out immediately, which is surge. Surge means like a rush of, right? Like an increase, right? So when I say this surge of tourism, it really fits, right? It really fits because if you have a surge in tourism, that implies that you have a lot of tourists, which really matches with the context of this influx of visitors, right? That's the key. Remember guys, these types of questions, the correct answer will always be supported by context cues. So there's gonna be some information in the surrounding text that's going to guarantee support the answer to the question. 
Okay, so you always want to look at the surrounding information for clues and cues, right, uh, that tell you, that signal or indicates to you that, bam, that's the correct answer. Okay, so I know that surge is going to be the correct answer because it fits well. I know that it is supported by the context, especially with this influx of visitors. Right, because that really um, supports the idea that there's a surge in tourism. If there's a surge in tourism, that implies that there's more tourists coming in. Right, and that would really align well with this influx of visitors. Okay, so I am done. Don't have to even worry about the other questions. Right, don't have to worry about the other questions um, because I don't have to, you know, I don't have to deal with it. Remember, you guys, the correct answer to these types of questions will always produce a meaning that is clear and straightforward. The SAT is not trying to trick you, not trying to make your life hard for you, right? They're not trying to be so sort of tricky with the English language, right? Like the SAT can't do that, right? When the SAT creates a correct answer for vocab questions, for vocab and context questions, the correct answer will always produce a meaning that's clear and straightforward and supported by the context in the passage. And that's it. Okay, so moving on, you guys. Question number two. Uh, it says, during the Renaissance period, Leonardo da Vinci was not only known for his paintings, but also for his innovations in scientific observations. So these are the two things that he was known for, right? Well, not the only two things, but that the passage gives, right? He's known for, bam, paintings and also for these things. Uh, his sketchbooks filled with detailed drawings and notes demonstrated his blank. So we know that his sketchbooks kind of gave evidence about some characteristic of da Vinci, right? Uh, unlike many of his contemporaries, so Leonardo da Vinci was different than his contemporaries. He approached both art and science with a deep sense of curiosity and analytical thinking. These are the sort of context cues and context clues that I notice in this question. Um, so I know that the answer to this question has to go in a positive direction. It has to be relate to like d being detailed, detail oriented, um, being you know curious, being careful, being analytical. Right? That's analytical means you break something down, like you analyze it, um, you deconstruct it, you look closely and carefully at something. You're very thoughtful and observant with stuff, right? So I got, I'm looking at these and I know these words pretty well. I'm confident with all of them. And I noticed that, boom, precision jumps out immediately, right? So if you're very precise, what does it mean to be precise? If, if, if it demonstrates his precision, if you're precise with something, it implies that you're very sort of like accurate, right? You're very sort of meticulous. You're very detailed. Yeah, something that's very, like a Ferrari is a very precise machine. Right, like the parts and stuff are all carefully handcrafted and they fit perfectly. You know, that's what it means to be very precise. It's not, the, the opposite of precision would be like sloppiness. If you're very sloppy, you just kind of do things, right? But if you're very precise, you're very in how you do, in how you do things, right? And so or precision really matches well with the context cues here in terms of his drawings being very detailed, right? And him being very analytical. Right? Um, being very an analytical, again, it implies, right, that you're breaking things down, that you're very detail oriented, that you examine stuff carefully and closely, that you're very meticulous, right? And so it all matches up, though. Okay? Now, um, I, I would say that mediocrity and indifference, these are more negative words, right? Indifference means you don't care, right? How would you not care? How? So th this doesn't make any sense, right? Because how can you not care but still be very uh, curious? Have Hey kids, uh, welcome back to your digital SAT <laughs> reading and writing classroom. Uh, your digital classroom, I should say. Um, guys, I, I do, it's me, Jin Teacher, Jin Sem. I, I do want to let you guys know that um, my number one priority, my number one goal, my number one mission for each and every one of you guys is to really help you guys, you know, get at least in the 90, 90th percentile. I know that ultimately, my ultimate goal is to help you guys get fewer than five wrong consistently on the ERW section. Um, just time and time again, no matter how difficult the that SAT exam is, I want you guys to still be able to get, I want you guys to still have the foundational knowledge, the tools, the skills, 
um, the tips, the strategies, all of the things to be able to get fewer than five wrong, right, uh, on the ERW section of a test. Um, I know that this itself, taking four practice tests, isn't going to get you there. Um, it could get some of you guys there. Uh, I hope it does get a lot of you guys there, but I do know that for the majority of us, um, a lot more interaction, a lot more work, a lot more self-studying, a lot more foundational knowledge is necessary, um, which is why, you guys, I really want to emphasize that um, I am putting myself out there. Like, I'm not in Korea anymore teaching at Hagwans. I'm building my own online education company where, you know, it's my mission, you know, is to create these life-changing educational experiences for millions of people around the world. And I know the way that to do that is to utilize the internet. Um, so I am putting myself out there on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok. So, you know, and if you guys find me, uh, if you guys ever see me pop up somewhere, right, like really just drop by and say hello. Like reach out if you guys really need some help, um, some extra help, uh, because I am committed to helping you guys achieve all you want to achieve on this test. Um, I've been there before, you know, like I've, I, I've, I'm, I've done what you guys want to do and I've done it multiple times. I've also helped countless people. Um, I say 80 85 percent of my students that i work with for at least two months two to three months 10 weeks maybe a little bit longer um, score in at least the 90th percentile on the grammar portion of the test right because that's what i focused on there was a separate reading teacher um, so i'm very confident in what i can do for you guys but i know that i need the interaction right so i can't i mean i'm here standing and talking to you guys in front of a screen and I know it's going to help you guys, some of you guys out, but I do know that there's still questions that some of you guys have and there's still questions that I have about how you guys are doing and things like that, you know, and that interaction is the only way that we can really, um, you know, make this stuff happen, okay? And so I am going to do this. And you're going to start to see me all over the place online. Um, if you guys ever do come across me, come, you know, say what's up, uh, ask a question, right? Join a free class, get some free content, right? And um, yeah, just really best of luck on your mission, you guys. Okay. So uh, jumping into this test, y'all, um, let's start with those words in context, those vocab in context questions. Okay. So the passage says, it's adapted from the novel, The Hungry Tide. The narrator describes a scene in the Sundarbans, a mangrove region in India and Bangladesh. The fishermen of Lucy Bari, clad in their traditional lungis, were navigating the labyrinthine waterways of the Sundarbans as they maneuvered through uh, their dingy, I have no idea how to pronounce these words. It sounds ridiculous though, right? Um, through the dense foliage, they were constantly blanked by the low hanging branches and the swift currents of the tide. So the currents and the, the, the tide and the branches did something to them, right? Which made their journey longer than anticipated. So the branches and the swift currents of the tide made their journey longer than anticipated, right? Um, so we're looking for, so if we look at the answer choices here, uh, I, I know all of these words. Um, and, and I'm going with, so here, guided makes no sense, right? Them being guided by the hanging branches, making their journey longer than anticipated doesn't work. It's not logical. Makes you confused. Unaffected also doesn't work because they were clearly affected and made their journey longer than anticipated, right? Now, here's the thing. If you got this question wrong, you chose threaten, but you can't choose threaten here because threaten would imply that their life is in danger, right? Um... And so it wouldn't work here. The more precise word would be rerouted. Because if you're rerouted, it implies that you have to go in a roundabout way to your destination, right? So if you have a route like this and you're constantly getting rerouted, you're having to go like this and like this and like this. So that implies that you're actually going off course to come back on course, right? And that implies more directly or precisely that your journey is going to be longer than anticipated. Right, so this is why C here would work best, right, among these four answer choices. 
Question number two. It says the Yano Navia. The reason why I, 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 I write or use like more cultural and hard to pronounce words that I can't even pronounce and I don't care uh, is because the SAT does this too. Because one of the things that the SAT ilburu on purpose that they're doing is that they're, they're putting these long, hard, difficult to pronounce words, right, to make your life more confusing. Now, don't fall into the trap of wasting your time trying to pronounce words perfectly. Don't do that. That's how we read when we were in second grade, right? When the teacher called on us one by one to ask us to read a sentence or a paragraph, we would just focus on the Yanomami tribe of the, oh, good, Jen. Right? I, on the SAT, they're not going to give you points for that. They're not going to give you praise for that. I don't. It's just a waste of your time to focus on it. As long as you know that it's some kind of tribe of the Amazon rainforest, that's enough. It's people. Right? It's enough I'm going to say about that. So every time I mess up when I, when I pronounce words, I don't care. I just laugh it off. Um, and you guys should too. Right? As long as you guys know how that word is being used. Right? Oh, they're talking about a tribe. Right? The Y tribe. You know, do something like that. But don't get caught up, right? Don't get hung up on pronunciation. It's a waste of your time, right? And remember, I told you guys, your, the only thing you have to think about or do is you, you have to only do that which moves you towards your goals, right? When you think about learning pronunciation, does that help you move you towards your goals of getting in the 99th percentile on the SAT? Not at all. So don't do it. Anyways, we have this Y tribe of the Amazon and the Sami people of Northern Europe have developed some remarkable practices in response to their harsh environments. Okay, so they have some behaviors, right, that they had to, 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 to be able to develop in response to their environment. The Y guys engage in shifting agriculture and sustainable hunting to thrive in the dense tropical forest, this is their environment, while the Sami practice reindeer herding and fishing to survive in the Arctic regions, the cold area. So these what, right? So these, so these blank is referring to these practices, right? It, they allow them to navigate and endure the challenges of their habitat. So guys, the key here is really these practices are in response. Think about that. If it's in response to something, it implies that it wasn't natural. It had to be developed or learned, right? Or thought about because they had to respond to the stimulus, which was their harsh environment, right? This tells me that, oh, the adaptations are gonna be the correct answer. If you got this question wrong, you probably chose traditions, but traditions is incorrect here because it's not supported by the context. Now remember you guys, every single correct answer on these, for these questions must be supported by the context. Just because they mention, right, tribal or cultural names and places doesn't mean they're talking about traditional behaviors, right? Their traditional behaviors are things that they've done for thousands of years. Right? It's part of their culture or their heritage. There isn't that type of information being discussed in the context. Right? The context is telling us about the adaptations that they did, right? the changes that they had to make in response to their environment. Right? So this is why you can't choose things like that. Okay? And then dispositions, don't know the meaning, it's okay, right? Because you know what adaptations is and you know the key information, right? They had to develop these practices in response to their environment, that is the definition of an adaptation, right? Um, dispositions just means like your songkyok, your character, your personality, right? That doesn't work here. Because uh, it's not talking about their personality or their attitudes, it's talking about their... Hey kids, welcome back. So let's, we just came off of the heels of answering that uh, pretty challenging but totally doable reading set. Now we're going to jump into the grammar portions. Guys, for the grammar questions, the most important thing to do uh, is focus on one thing at a time. That's all I can say, right? I, I, I say that this is the single most important thing um, to your success when it comes to the grammar questions, right? So focusing on one thing at a time and do things with intention. Don't just start here just because it's up there, right? Like, you know, intentionally, like be strategic about it, right? Do things with purpose. For these grammar questions, you guys, I'm telling you, the best way to look, do this is glance at the answer choices, recognize what 
take a guess, yeah, at an educated guess at what the concept is that's tested. You know it's pronouns, right? And then from there, start reading. Remember, when you're reading, plug in answer choice A into the statement to give it a little bit more continuity, right? Even though it's wrong, just plug it in, except for the transition questions. That's what I mean, like doing things one thing at a time, right? Um, single most important thing you could do for the grammar questions, okay? So, like we said, pronoun question, let's jump into it. Because we know that when we're being tested on pronouns, our minds are thinking, our brains are thinking about, right? We got to think about what? We got to think about um, clarity, clarity, right? Singular pronouns have to have a singular noun, right? What, you know, so you're reading for that, right? You got to understand the logic of what you're reading, the context. So here it says, um, each year sandhill cranes embark on a breathtaking migration. Traveling from the breeding grounds in the northern U.S. and Canada to their wintering habitats in the southern United States and Mexico. So they go from here to there. Uh, what's truly captivating about the migration is not just the distance they cover, huh? right, but the elaborate courtship dances they perform um, upon arrival. Cranes bow, leap in the air, and flap their wings, a ritual that strengthens the pair bonds and has been observed by these guys for decades. So here's the thing. Um, how I like to solve pronoun questions is by reading it and understanding the context, right? So what's truly captivating about who or about what, right? Is, and so the key here is to look at what comes afterwards. So what's truly captivating about what, right, is not the distance they cover, right? So if you think about it, what's truly captivating about, you're really talking about the birds, the birds, the birds, right? Because if, if you say, if you plug in A, you say, What's truly captivating about the migration, now that part of it can be fine, but what comes afterwards has to match with that, right? It has to talk about the captivating aspect of the migration, but does it do that? It doesn't, right? So it's not logical, right? So when it says what's truly captivating about the migration is not just the distance they cover, you're like, what? The distance they cover, how is that the captivate, you know, it, the, the, the dances they perform? How is the migration performing dances? And that's the captivating thing about the migration. It doesn't make logical sense, right? So we got to cross this guy out. It's not logical, right? And I told you guys, when you have noun answer choices on pronoun questions, and if you haven't encountered one of these yet in college boards tests, you will, maybe on the actual test, right? I don't want you, I don't want you guys to get thrown off by these. Right, so start with the noun ones because they're usually correct. You just have to plug them in and make sure they make logical sense. If they make logical sense, boom, that's your answer. Right, so we know it's not the migration, but when we plug in these birds, these birds is referring to the cranes, right? That was mentioned previously. So when it's, now when we plug it in and read it, it says what's truly captivating about these birds is not the, the distance they cover. Right, so now we know that it, it's, it's logical because it's the birds that cover the distance, it's the dances, it's the birds that perform the dances. And that's the captivating thing about the birds. Right, so D would be the correct answer here. Now some of you guys are thinking, well why not B, why not B, why not B, right? Well, if you plug in them, them is a plural pronoun. And if we look at the previous sentence, well, I think there's two problems with it. Number one, if we look at the previous sentence, there's multiple plural nouns, right? Like the wintering habitats, is that what's captivating? Right, is it the breeding grounds, right? Like, or is it the cranes? Like, there's just too much ambiguity, right? The other reason why them doesn't work is because it just creates a lack of um, clarity in the sentence. Just think about how, listen to how it reads. What's truly captivating about them is not the distance they cover, but the elaborate courtships they perform. Right? Wouldn't it make more, wouldn't it be more clear if you had like a noun, right? What's truly captivating about these birds is that they do this and they do that. That's more clear, right? So this is why B here wouldn't work, right? It just doesn't do a very good job with clarity. Cool. So D would be the correct answer for that question. Question number 17. Do you guys kind of know, like, were you guys able to guess what type of question this was? No, it's sentence structure. I say it up here, but I'm not sure if it's clear to you, to you guys here. Um, but yeah, typically when you have like the, 
the which and then the ing in a different sort of like form, like struct different words to it, like and boost versus boosting, which boost, which boosting, right? Um, they're really testing you on sentence structure, right? Uh, it, it's one of the things they might be testing you on. So we want to make sure to read with grammar in mind. Right, so it says, I'm going to start with the second sentence. It says, studies have shown that when people feel nostalgic, they tend to uh, view their lives with greater positivity, which boosting their self-esteem and reduce their feelings of loneliness. Okay, so do me a favor, you guys. Number one, underline, from, underline the word which all the way to loneliness. So this is a dependent clause. We talked about this, right? It's a dependent clause. Um, more specifically, it's a relative clause. It's like these relative clauses that begin with these relative pronouns, right? Like who, whom, which, that, where, whose, W-H-O-S-E, right? Um, I said when and where, right? Okay, I think I did. So there's seven of them, right? There's seven of them. Anyways, uh, remember this, you guys. For every dependent clause, write this down next to it. Every dependent clause must always have a verb inside of it. Every dependent clause must always have a verb inside of it. Not a verb that just looks like, not a word that just looks like a verb, right? But a verb, a word that actually functions or acts like a verb, right? So we talked about this. Boosting ing words by themselves isn't a verb, right? This is why, you know, A wouldn't work because what happens is this structure, Right. This structure, the, de the dependent clause component or the structure is not properly formed, right? Because the proper structure or the proper form of the dependent clause has to include a verb, right? So this would be why A would be incorrect. Now, if we look at... Um, if we take a look at answer choice D... Right, um, it says and boost, right? So now if we look, plug it back to the sentence, it says they tend to view, uh, they tend to view their lives with greater positivity and boost, and boost their self-esteem uh, and reduce feelings of loneliness, right? So this is going to be interesting. There's several things wrong with this structure. I don't know if you guys noticed. It just kind of sounds a little bit awkward. Um, so here, when you say they tend, so we, we have a list, right? So this word and is a connecting word, and, and it connects verbs in this case, right? Because if we look at the word that comes after the and, it says and boost. So we have to have another verb that's kind of similar in function or form, right? Like a verb, and a verb that like looks like a present tense verb. Right, um, and it creates a list, right? So now, if you think about it, the, the verb list that we have is, we have, uh, they tend, it could either start here, right? they tend to view their lives with greater positivity and boost their self-esteem and reduce their feelings of loneliness, right? Like that list is not properly formed. Right, because if we do have a list of three verbs, right, they tend to, if you want to say tends to view as your verb, that's fine. But let's just put it at they tend. Right, they tend to, to view their lives with greater positivity and boost their self-esteem. They boost their self-esteem and they reduce feelings. If you have a list of three things, you don't want to have the and between the first and the second item. Right, you have to put a comma here boost your self-esteem and you have to put a comma here. Hey kids, welcome back to your DSAT uh, ERW digital classroom. Uh, again, it's me, Jin teacher, Jin Sem, you, Jin, whatever you want to call me, you guys, your guide, your psychologist, your trainer, your coach, your instructor, your teacher, um, all that stuff kind of works perfectly fine. Uh, guys, we're going to break down um, <clears throat> modules to the hard section for practice test number three. Um, so hopefully at this point, um, you guys already have have had two practice tests, full practice tests under your belt. Maybe some of you guys went the extra mile and, and did some of the college board stuff, um, as well as some other practice tests you might have kind of scrounged uh, or, or came about um, or, or, or kind of found um, on, on, on other platforms or other, other websites. 
Um, but we are going to, so, so at this point in your journey, you guys should be at the stage where you kind of have some type of familiarity with the questions that the SAT asks. Uh, as well as establishing, you guys have probably, some of you guys have probably established somewhat of a process, right, of answering these questions. Um, at this point, uh, we do want to kind of refine, right? We do want to refine your process, as well as, like, I do want to bring to your attention some of the uh, different ways that the SAT, not necessarily more of the common ways, but just some of the ways that the SAT can uh, kind of present some of the answer choices, right? So I have, so everything that you guys are, are, are reading, everything that you guys are answering is based off of my observations from all of the uh, material from College Board, right? The official, um, unofficial, released, unreleased exams. Um, so if I've seen it once, uh, on an SAT test, then it's 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 in here, right? Which is why I put this in here. So I'm not putting anything in this test, uh, in this course that I haven't seen before on a test, right? So just please understand that. Even though these might not be the most common ways, uh, I think that's why I kind of put them in the sort of hard section is because sometimes when st when when students come across or encounter like a question that they're not as familiar with, they tend to not be as confident about, you know, answering that question because they haven't seen this style or this type of question before, the way that the answer choices are presented or the way that the question is worded or the way that the passage is, is phrased is they might not be as familiar with, right? So I just wanted to bring to your attention some of those things um, within this test, okay? So uh, question number one, the vocab questions, you guys, yeah? Um, the passage reads, the intricate structure of honeybee colonies has long fascinated scientists. Among the many complex behaviors exhibited by these insects, one of the most remarkable is their method of communication. The waggle dance performed by foraging bees is critical to the survival of the hive. Um, this behavior not only, so we know that it's, a, it, it's critical, it's crucial to their survival, Right, uh, they have a lot of complex behaviors. It's remarkable, right? Um, this behavior not only communicates the location of food sources, but is also blank. So it's also something to ensuring the colony thrives uh, even in challenging environments. Okay, so we know that this word here has to be uh, more in the positive direction, right? Because we know that it has to ensure it has to connect to the survival and the thriving of these honeybees in challenging times right so uh, we start to we can start to play like this negative positive game um, so one of the new things that you guys I don't know if I put these phrases you know um, with the preposition and stuff in um, a previous test yet I'm not sure if I have or not old age early onset Alzheimer's. But um, if you guys haven't seen this before, like this is another sort of style of answer choice that you guys might see. Sometimes you won't just see a word, sometimes you will see a phrase, right, um, as answer choices. And so in these kind of cases, you guys, you always wanna make sure that not just the meaning of the word itself, you know, outside of the context, right, is, you know, appropriate, but you also wanna make sure that it fits that it fits grammatically and it fits logically within this arrangement of words. So one of the mistakes that students will make is they will just, you know, they will choose an answer, you know, whose definition of that, whose definition um, kind of makes sense, right? Just based off of like what the, and is topical, is based off of the topic that the passage talked about or discussed, but when you put it in this arrangement of words, it doesn't work. It's not grammatically correct or and or it's not logical. Like it doesn't fit based off of this combination or this arrangement of words. You know, so that's one of the things that I want to bring to you guys' attention, right, is it has to work when you plug it in and read it as such, okay? And so um, we'll do that with some of these. I think there is one trap answer here. I can kind of see one. So we do want more of a positive word, yeah? And I think that these two guys are more negative. Uh, the connotations are more negative. Um, subjected to just means that you're kind of forced to undergo 
a sort of particular experience, one that's not necessarily very positive. It's typically hard um, and, and not more like you're forced to do it, right? So for example, if you're, if people are subjected to um, strict rules, it means that you're forced to, you know, um, be in that type of environment where those rules are placed upon you, you know? Um, so subjected to kind of means that, right? Um, and so here that wouldn't fit at all, right? Because if you're subjected to it, it almost implies that you don't have freedom, right? That you're kind of limited or very restricted and that just doesn't fit here logically. It's one of those ones where they're talking about it more in like a negative sense, right? So I don't like that. And same thing with inessential. Inessential is more of a contradiction, right? If it's ines inessential to, to ensuring the colony thrives, it, it means that it's unimportant too, right? Which really goes against the positive tone that this sentence sets up and, and also goes against or is contradictory to the crucialness, right? Uh, it's, it's the importance or how critical it is to their survival, right? So we can get rid of that guy as well. Now, um, Here's the thing, right? So integral means it's importance to or it's criticals to, right? So this would be the correct answer. And the context clues, right, that really fit that is, are these two things, right? It's, it's, it's that it's crucial, the waggle dance is crucial to the survival, right? So that behavior is the behavior of the dance, right? That's gonna be integrals to, right, ensuring that it thrives, right? So that it thrives, that it implies that it not only survives, but it also does really well. It gets successful, right? Um, so it kind of fits based off of the, the context clues there. Now, you might be thinking reliant on, right? Reliant. Well, that means that, hey, you know, so some of you guys, if you got this one wrong, you probably chose B because you guys are thinking, well, reliant means it's dependent on, right? So if you're dependent on something, that means that you need that thing. Right? So you might be thinking, oh, well, these ants are dependent on this dance. I'm sorry, not the ants, the bees. Right? The bees are reliant on this dance, right? But, and that's true because it's crucial to their survival. That means, therefore, it means that, you know, you need it, right? It's, it's, it's something that you're reliant on. But when you plug this in, it doesn't work, right? Because what this means, this creates a meaning that's nonsensical. Right, because when you say the behavior is reliant on ensuring the, the colony thrives, that doesn't make any sense, right, grammatically and logically, right? It should say that the bees are reliant on this dance for their survival, but this is saying, this pattern of words, this arrangement of words says that the behavior is reliant on ensuring the colony thrives. Like, does that make sense? It doesn't, right? It's one of those that your brain kind of struggles to grasp the meaning of, right? And so that's another type of answer choice that you want to be aware of, like a trap answer, right? Where the meaning of that word kind of fits right in within the topic that was being discussed, the ideas that were being developed, but it doesn't work when you plug it into the sentence, right? Because the arrangement of words makes it not grammatical and not logical. Yeah, so watch out for that. Um, it's rarer that you get that, but it is something that I have seen. So it is something that you want to, I want to make you guys aware of as well. Um, so number two, Another one of these examples, right? So it says, uh, Shonda Rhimes' television series Bridgerton uh, has captivated audiences worldwide with its opulent settings, intricate plot lines, and a meticulously crafted ensemble cast. So we know that it's, 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 a very, it's a very engaging show, right? Like audiences are captivated by it, right? It has a very positive impact on them. Um, the series indeed has become a cultural phenomenon, right? Meaning that it's really popular, right? Uh, it's praised for its innovative approach to, to period drama. So we do know that it's very, it's, it's, it's awesome. Hey kids, welcome back. So voice is a little coarse today. Um, yeah, just, just feeling a little bit kind of under the weather, but that's okay, you guys. Uh, don't mind the voice, don't mind me. I'm still gonna give you guys those quality explanations that you guys need um, to, to boost your scores on this test, okay? So question number 23, y'all. Um, transition questions, right? So we wanna make sure that we have our independent clauses kind of ready to go, right? Because you wanna make sure to uh, understand uh, what each independent clause is saying independently. 
Right, so understand, so make sure that you know what the independent clause is saying one at a time. Um, don't try to mix everything up together. Um, don't try to combine everything and do it all at once, right? Like take your time. Um, like first take a look at that first independent clause. Um, pause for a moment to make sure that you clearly understand what it's saying, you know, what it, what it implies, what it does, whatever levels that you need to, and then you go on to the second independent clause and do the same thing, and then you kind of think about, well, what's the relationship between these, right? You can take a look at the answer choices and you can start working backwards by eliminating wrong answer choices uh, because the transitions don't show that relationship, okay? so. Here it says, a regular physical activity is essential for children's healthy development. Exercise not only strengthens their body, but also improves their cognitive function and concentration. Uh, for instance, children who engage in regular physical activities tend to perform better academically. So what's, uh, so they're really talking about a benefit, right? A benefit of exercise, yeah? And more specifically, if we look at the specific benefit, uh, we got the better academic performance though, right? Uh, which is, which relates to the cognitive function, yeah? Um, so we got the better grades, right? I'm gonna put A plus, A plus, um, better grades. And then we have a sentence that says, um, exercise helps them develop social skills as they interact with peers and team sports. So you guys tell me, well, what is a second independent clause kind of doing? Is the direction of the second independent clause going in a similar direction? So are we, have, are we having like the same, a similar conversation about exercise? Or are we kind of totally changing it up? Right, well, we're definitely having a similar conversation, right, because we're talking about another benefit of exercise. So a little bit more generally, think, looking at the sentence a little bit more generally, right, we know that um, it, it's just giving us an additional benefit of exercise, right, and the additional benefit is friends, right? Uh, I'll put stick figures, right? You make friends, you have social, you develop social skills when you interact with peers and team sports. Um, so because we are going in a similar direction, uh, we don't want to use any contrasting transitions. And also, you guys, when you see two transitions whose functions are ex exactly the same, two transitions whose functions are identical, right? So therefore, and as a result, right, um, function identically, meaning that they're used in both the same precise way, right? So when you have two transitions whose functions are identical, both of those cannot be the correct answer, right? Therefore, logically, they both have to be wrong, right? So you can eliminate those, okay? So this is why C would be the correct answer for this question. Uh, question number 24, you guys, let's create our little table here of independent clauses. It says, cuttlefish are fascinating creatures known for their ability to change color and texture almost instantaneously. These adaptations help them evade predators and communicate with each other. Additionally, their intelligence rivals that of octopuses, allowing them to solve complex problems and demonstrate learning capabilities. Wow, so if you think about well, what is this sentence talking about, right? Like what is it, uh, what is it saying, what is it doing? Um, we know it's talking about something positive, right? About uh, cuttlefish, right? And uh, the thing that's, the, the positive thing that the sentence is pointing to is uh, they're really smart, right? In terms of their ability to solve complex problems and demonstrate learning capabilities, yeah? Uh, and then once we wrap our mind around that, then going to the second sentence, it says, despite their cleverness and camouflage, cuttlefish have relatively short lifespans. Um, living one, typically living one to two years in the wild. So, we think about this second sentence, uh, the, the direction of the conversation kind of shifts, doesn't it? So we're no longer talking about some you know, positive qualities or positive things, uh, valuable things, right? Um, the happy things about the cuttlefish, we're now changing directions, right? To something a little bit more kind of ashiwa, something a little bit more, uh, not necessarily negative, right? Like they're bad animals, but it's something that's more of a deficiency, right? I mean, a deficiency is not the right word, but it, it's just something that's a little bit more in an opposite direction, right? Something that's kind of bad about cuttlefish. <laughs> Keep using that kind of language, but you guys know what I mean, right? So living only, so they have them having relatively short lifespans, that's like the Ashiwan Bubun, right? Akapta for these guys, um, because they're so smart, right? Uh, and so we are, we are kind of shifting it. Uh, they don't live long, right? They don't live long. We're shifting the direction, right?
So when we kind of change that direction to something that's going in a different direction, right, it, we're presenting something that's a little bit more unexpected. You know, because it seems like they live, it seems like if they're able to learn and if, if they're really, really smart and if they can evade predators and communicate with each other, it, it, it would be logical to assume or expect that they live a long time. Right? But when, we, when the sentence says, hey, they have relatively short lifespans, we're introducing something that's a little bit more unexpected or surprising given what we just learned about the cuttlefish. Right? So because of that, we know that uh, nevertheless is going to be the perfect transitions to use here. Um, remember, you guys, when you think about the for example, like the way that I hegger this, right, is <clears throat> you look at the independent clause. The independent clause is here, yeah? Um, Cuttlefish have relatively short lifespans. If C were the correct answer, then you know that the, what examples do is that they illustrate the point that was mentioned in the previous sentence. Right? That's what examples do by definition. Right? Examples are meant to illustrate, provide specific details about a general point that was mentioned previously. Right? So you can kind of check for that. Right? And you know that that's not what's going on, because um, the previous point, the previous sentence's point is that they're smart, right? So the example should relate to their intelligence, right? Their smartness, uh, but it doesn't. Yeah. So that's how you can kind of check. Uh, therefore, like consequently, you guys, remember, consequently, therefore, like these types of transitions, they usually introduce uh, conclusions that are more like logical, right? More like expected, right? So for example. If I say something like, um, you know, I, I, I hadn't eaten in two days, right, then you'd say, I'm really hungry, <laughs> right? So that would be a clear sort of like logical um, expectation. That would be a logical conclusion, an expected conclusion, right? You being hungry is the result of you not eating for two days, right? So that is how these consequently and therefore and thus and hence and as a result type of transitions will function, right? But when we introduce something that's a little bit more unexpected, so if you say, I hadn't eaten for three days, and then you say, oh, I'm not too hungry, that's something that's surprising, right? You would say nevertheless or still, right? Um, or however, right? So um, that's just how you want to kind of understand these. Understand them very simply. Like, don't try to make it too hard for yourself. I like to create a couple of example sentences, like real simple ones, right? To help me to understand more precisely the relationship of these transitions. And then finally would be like a time sequence transition, right? Where there would have to be like a progression of time, right? Like first, next, finally, right? And that's just not how the passage developed. So you know that that's not going to work. Um, question number 25, y'all. So, bioluminescence is a natural phenomenon where organisms produce light through chemical reactions within their bodies. This ability is most commonly observed in deep sea creatures where light is scarce. So, <clears throat> uh, sea creatures, right? Sea creatures, most sea creatures, right? Bioluminescence, right? bioluminescence. So basically they're saying that, hey, deep sea creatures are the ones, right, that uh, are most commonly seen, right, to have bioluminescence. Yep. Next sentence says, certain uh, terrestrial species, so now we're shifting from deep sea so ocean to land, terrestrial means land, right? Uh, terrestrial species such as fireflies um, also exhibit bioluminescence, using it for communication and mating purposes. Okay, so cool. So now we have uh, land creatures, right? Land creatures. So you think about what's going on here, you guys, yeah? Um, they're talking about two...